to the church about a month after and was talking about uh, making a difference for missions. And they really highlighted the speed of life. Matter of fact, this missionary came in and he said, look, uh, how many, we're going to build a church today. And somewhere in the afternoon he said, can anybody here give me $120,000? Of course, no one could. He said, but can anybody give me $100 for a bag of nails for that one wall in that church? Or can anybody here, uh, we, need, we need some, some drywall for this, or we need some metal studs, and if you can give me four of these, or this, so by the end of the day, guess what? That end of the service, we had built a church in Africa. Because somebody said, well, I can do four bags of nails, I can do, I can do a couple two-by-fours, I can do this or that. And, and the Lord began to put on my heart, the speed of light was important. And so the missionary also said, he said, we've bought a boat, because we're going to have to transport all this material down the area, no one has a boat, so we're gonna buy so we got a speed to light boat. And he said, We also need to buy that boat, so can you help us buy another one so we can build more churches? And I remember the Lord put on my heart, I was 15 years old, and the Lord said, Give $250 for that. And I was like, oh, what? You know, I'm working at a pizza place in town now. How can I do that? And I said, Okay, Lord, if this is big, you want me to do this? And so I began, I, I tied up my job and I saved that money up, and it took me about two months, and I had $250 set apart, and I still had a mowing job. And suddenly, I've got more people saying, hey, can you mow my yard? Hey, can you mow my yard? Hey, can you mow my yard? And I went from like 30 yards to about 60 in one summer. So my freshman year when I got saved, I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to give to missions? What do you want me to do for Speed of Light? And he said, $1,000. And I was like, ooh, Lord, I don't know. But then he said, in your sophomore year, you're going to give $2,000. In your junior year, you're going to give $3,000. And your senior, you're going to get four. I was like, God in heaven, how in the world? I'm a, kid, I'm a teenager. And by the time I got done, the end of my summer, my senior year, I was mowing almost 130 yards, rebuilding that engine every, every summer. I was able to take care of that, all those pledges, all those years as a teenager. So if, if you just say, Lord, use me, whatever. So whatever missions project you're interested in, it might be BGMC, it might be Speed the Light. But I'm telling you, we've got to have a heart for missions. And I will never apologize for having missionaries in this pulpit. I will never apologize for pushing Speed the Light or BGMC. I'll never, I will never apologize for trying to get the gospel out to as many people as we possibly can. So have a heart for missions, folks, because the Lord wants to use that. As I finish this series on, on Romans today, we're going to look at Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. It says this, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. Three times, God says God gave them up, God gave them up, and God gave them over in Romans 1, New American Standard. God gave them up to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper. People having been filled with all unrighteousness. I want you, as we're reading through these verses, to understand... This is the world in which we live. This is our present reality. This is government. This is leadership. This is systems all around us. This is the world in which we live. So do those things that are not proper. People having been filled with all, un not just a little bit of unrighteousness, all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, and evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, Haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. Catch that? Inventors of evil. How much more sin can we create and throw out on the world? How many things can we, can we create that will taunt and tempt younger people or kids or adults? Inventors of evil. Disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, you see, the Bible says God's given every man a measure of faith. No sinner, no heathen has any right to say, I don't see who you are. Nature itself proves that God is there. Right. Look at the human body. Look at, look at the creation around us. Yeah. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This is how Paul ends Romans chapter 1. I want you to catch the full weight of what he was saying. And earlier in this chapter is when he said, the righteous will live by faith. Because those are the kind of people we have to live by faith around. Yes. In that regards. So look at that verse once again, 28. Just as they did not see fit. You ever have that kid in your classroom, in school, no matter how long ago it was, that would not listen? Would not do what they wanted to do. The kids you knew was always going to be in the principal's office. The 
one voted most likely to, you know, end up in prison by the time they're 20? Come on, folks. Because by the fruit, they'll be known, right? By the fruit, you will know them. And most of the time, by the time we graduated high school, all of us had a pretty good idea of who was going to succeed and who was not. By the time you get to middle school, you understand the personalities and characteristics of those people that you're sitting around. You know who to avoid and who you want to be right around, right? Guess what? Some of you parents, when, when your, your daughters brought guys home, you said, uh-uh. Don't come back. Why? Because you discern those things. And in this world, this is what we're seeing. They threw the idea of a God totally out of the imagination, and so he gave them up to a depraved mind. That means a morally corrupt and wicked state. That means every thought, every intention of their heart is evil and wicked. We live in a violent, a violent culture, a violent society. A society that says, get anything you can, any way you can, from whoever you can, and don't worry about the cost or the consequences. That's the depraved mind. God gave them up. Basically, God steps back and says, okay, I'm done. You can do what you want. Imagine if a warden of a prison announced over the lines one day, the, 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 the intercom, hey guys, we're tired of taking care of you. So you guys are just on your own. We're going to leave food in the kitchen. You can come eat it. You guys do what you want to do. Is that not similar to what's happening in our culture and society today? And people who don't care about your concerns, your rights, your values, your constitution, guess what? They're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing to get what they want when they want it. And they cannot but help themselves to do things that are not proper. This is what God's Word says. We all understand what proper is. Just go out for a drive on a highway. And you'll find out what's proper when people are driving around you. We can whine and gripe a lot about people and how they drive and this and that, but nonetheless, there's supposed to be law and order. That's why we have yellow lines and white lines and guardrails and stoplights and stop signs. If you've ever traveled to a, uh, a South American country like Ecuador or Jamaica or, or someplace in the Caribbean, I remember my, my, my going, trying to get to uh, Red Square in the Kremlin when I was in, in Moscow and realizing that the highway was eight lanes wide. There was none of those none of those white lines that were kind of you know kind of separated so you can walk across. I asked the one guy, I said, "How easy is it to get across?" He said, "Most people don't make it." <laughs> now, when people in Moscow say that, it's like, "Okay, what's the safest way?" He said, "Take the train here, go underneath, and come up on their side." So we learned that. In other words, not everybody stays within the lines, folks. Not everybody follows the the the, the, the order that God has put out there. And in Deuteronomy chapter 16, we talked last Wednesday night about justice. The one most important thing we're supposed to pursue in life is justice. And he says to do that because then you'll have possession of the land. And when the justice department becomes corrupt, everything else becomes corrupt too. And so that's where we are in America. And so these guys then, it becomes an attempt to out the others sitting around them. You want to know why everybody's coming out with this new thing? With this new identity? Or on this today or on that? It's because they want to keep out -sinning. What else? How far, how far, how close to the edge can we get before we teeter off? And the younger generation does not have the values or the understanding or the life history, life experience to understand some of the things that we deal with in life or the consequences. Some of you understand consequences because you've had to deal with them. And that's why we as parents say to our kids, don't do that. Don't think that. Don't go there. Don't date him. Don't date her. Look at your future. Think about those things. An entire generation has no idea except what, what they see from us and hear from us. But yet, this is what, what Paul says. There's a group of people out there who have been given over to a depraved mind, and that depraved mind is not going to take them anywhere good. Anywhere good in that regards. It becomes their tendency. And here's the thing. We should not be surprised by it at all. Remember being a youth pastor having some young guys come in that were just just as heathen as you can imagine. One of my main disciples, was, his name was Kiefer. Kiefer came and said, Pastor Dana, man, these guys are like bums, man. We don't, we don't need them in our church. They're, they're going to corrupt the girls in our church. He said, they need to behave. And I said, they're not Christians, Kiefer. 
So they can learn from you how to behave in church. They need, to be, they need to learn from you how to talk. And what we're, so, so make sure, Keith, when you're talking and you're talking to them, words aren't slipping out that shouldn't slip out. Oh, okay. You see, your witness makes a difference out there. But the world doesn't know how they're supposed to act. And sometimes in the church in recent days, we can see that many Christians in the church aren't acting like what the Bible tells us to act like. We keep getting involved with things that, that bring a challenge to our faith. And also ruin our witness in the, in the watching world. And we need to not be surprised by that, especially all the more as we see the day approaching. Forsake not the assembly together of yourselves and all the more as we see the day approaching, the author of Hebrews says. Why? He was saying, when we get to the end time, it's going to get weird. It's going to get strange. We got people identifying as binary numbers. XOX. I thought that was hugs and kisses when I was a kid. Now you got people wanting to marry pizzas and animals. And since the, marriage, the definition of marriage has been changed, what is next, folks? I'm telling you what. You, we're not gonna, we, we will be terrified and surprised by what they come out with next. And why? Because they've been given over to a depraved mind in that regards. If we look at 29 to 31, people having been filled, and this is the key, been filled. Filled by who? Filled by what? Filled by their, 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 their influences. Filled by the resources around them. You know, since COVID hit and things got shut down, the average amount of web pages that people hit per day, TV shows they were watching. Have you, have you looked at, if, just for something fun, look at what the, what the, uh, the, uh, the income and the stock values were at places like Apple TV and Netflix as of March of last year. See what happened over the next seven or eight months with those stocks. Find out that people were, were spent more time on the internet than they did any other thing. Because there was nothing to go to work, to go here, to go eat, to do this, to do that, so they were on the internet. All unrighteous, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, those with parents, without understanding, without untru untrustworthy, unfeeling, and unmerciful. You see, worst of the worst is what happens. They've been given up. They've been, go, they've been given over to degrading passions. They've been given over to depraved minds. And now we should expect when those emotions are so raw, people don't know who they are or what they are. And people in our nation are angry. They are mad at the world, aren't they? We're going to get a better response from that. The world is just a sad place and everybody's unhappy and quiet and forgiving and understanding. You all know better than that. I'm in Kentucky, you're in Kentucky. I'm required by law to say y'all once. Okay? Y'all are aware of that. The worst of the worst is what happens when the emotions are raw and the hearts are unchecked. When people say, I have no moral code to walk by, what can you expect to happen around you? When government has no moral code to walk by, when court systems and the Justice Department has no, no, no moral code to walk by, what is going to happen to the citizen? Why are there still cities like Portland and Seattle that are an absolute tyranny? Because the leaders have stepped back and said, criminals have your way. Welcome to America. In the two years time, two and a half years time that Hannah was in Minneapolis, the one thing I got to see, especially because George Floyd was killed just several blocks from where she was sleeping in her dorm room every night. And so we'd go to pick her up or driving up, you had to go by certain areas. And I'm telling you what, I watched that city and the places I was going into like it rotted. It was, it was just like, oh my goodness, look at that. How, how did this happen? In just a couple of years. Why? Because once that sort of thing takes root, nothing matters anymore. And we begin to deal with all those things. It was full of unrighteousness, which is all that follows, which fills the heart with darkness. So if your heart is filled with darkness, guess what? There is no, there's nothing but unrighteousness there. So this is why you've got to watch your steps, walk where you're going, watch how you're walking. Whether it's at the federal level, the state level, the local level, whatever, we are, we are surrounded by people who have no moral code. No absolutes. 
No right and no wrong. Anything goes. It would, if it feels good, do it. That's the world in which we live. And that's the world that, that Paul warned us about. But also Paul was saying, these things are happening now. In his time. The things we're facing really aren't different. They're just highlighted a whole lot more. And yet, there's new types of sin, and new this and new that, and all sorts of areas out there. But the world is, see we are seeing those things happen, and it robs understanding. In other words, the ability to comprehend the current reality. That's why so many people in this nation right now are absolutely, totally asleep at the wheel. They have no idea if the guardrails have gone, the ditches, the, the bridge is out, and they're headed towards it at 100 miles an hour. People just flat out don't care. Have you noticed the numbness that people have? It's just a numbness. They've been so overwhelmed by COVID and this and that and, and, and mandates and masks and vaccines and all this. And, just, and people are just so tired of hearing. They just want to get back to normal. Normal will never exist again, folks. It never will. And we in the church have got to be the first ones to say, you know what? We recognize as believers, as believers in the Word of God, that it's never going to go back to normal. And because of that, we've got to take a stand now. Yes. Because the normal everybody else wants is not going to happen. Yeah. When they're looking for normal, they're never going to find it. That's why the suicide rates have been up. That's why prescription drug abuse has been up. Just since the COVID situation started. And I know from talking to other counselors, counseling is going up through the roof. I cannot tell you how many calls we get in this church every single week. I just need to talk to somebody because my life's falling apart. I'm, I'm nervous and this and that. And I'm talking to people from Kentucky. Within an 80 mile radius. People who don't know what to do. Their husbands are depressed. Their wives are depressed. There's this going on. That's going on. The kids are a mess. And they're just like, we don't know what to do. I've heard that. I don't know what to do. A thousand times in the last month and a half in this church. Answering phones. And Debbie and Raina can tell you, that phone rings a lot, doesn't it? People want to, just need somebody to talk to because they're hurting and they're wounded. They don't know what to do. It also robs trust. What's happening in the world robs trust. The ability to believe or be believed or to believe anything so they're unable to commit. And that's why when we as Christians blow our witness, we better go back and apologize to some people so they know that we're honest and genuine as Christians. Jesus said, if done, well, the least of these, my brothers, have done it to me. It doesn't just apply to mercy and grace, folks. Paul said, I made all things to all men, so by all means I might say that. But he never did anything that was sinful. He said, God, use me where I am. But let my, let my life be lived in such a way. Paul even said, if eating meat sacrifice idols causes my brothers to, to sin and stumble, I won't do it. So what are you willing to give up when a brother or sister says, man, you know, I, my, my spirit, I, my, I can't do that. I can't do what you do, but, you know, I'm struggling because I'm watching you. I think you're a strong Christian. What the principle of Scripture is, stop doing it. Say, you know what, brother, if it hurts you that much, I'm not going to do it either. Yes. But the church where we don't sacrifice like that, we're like, well, wait a minute. My, my, my rights end right here where you're starting. It's not about rights. It's about helping somebody else grow in the grace and nature of Christ. Amen. The knowledge of who He is in that regards. It also robs the feeling. People become numb to the constant sensations of living. As I was praying for the notes and things to put on this, this phrase was there. People become numb to the constant sensations of living. There's many conditions where people are very sensitive to touch and things like that. Been diagnosed in the last, you know, in the last 20, 30 years. Sometimes it's people that just can't deal with the noise and the, the wind of life. But every single day, it seems that there's more bad news, there's more this, there's more that. And we carry these things. And you've got to learn how to release things. There's a post. When I walk from, the, from here to the house or the house to here, there's a wooden post, like a fence post out there in that little field between us and the recycling center. And there are days that I very much try my best when I walk past that post to leave stuff there that I don't want to take home to my wife. And some days it's very, very difficult. 
Because it's going through your mind, you're trying to help people, situate them with your own situations, you're trying to figure it all out, and yet you got all this stuff going on. And you're like, but I just need to leave that there, and then, and then I try to pick it up the next morning when I walk over here. But people are numb. People are literally numb to the, to the world around them. It also robs of mercy. The ability to overlook the terrible in others. And I want you to really think about this. When people hurt you, wound you, deceive you, lie to you, dishonor you, rob you, the Word of God still says we must forgive. And let me tell you something about forgiveness. There is no such thing as instantaneous forgiveness unless it comes from Jesus. He's the only one that can do it. So when that person says, you say you're sorry, they may say they're sorry, but you're still going to deal with them. Right? Anybody else here human today? I want to make sure. I'm among friends and peers. You see, we want that instant apology. We want that instant everything. It doesn't work like that. When you break something, it takes time to put it back together. You chip it, you dent it, you scratch it. My dad, when he had a decent job in his business in the early 70s, would buy a brand new car every year. And remember in the days, some of you don't remember this, but many of you will, when the gas tank was behind the license plate. And you, well, my dad would take a screwdriver. He'd come home in a new car, we'd be dancing around. Like, this is so cool. And my dad would take a screwdriver. He would pull down the, the license plate and take the screwdriver and scratch the paint. Dad, what are you doing? He said, now I don't have to worry about the first scratch. <laughs> now, just so you know, I don't do that with my cars. Never have, never will, and I'm going to start. But the point was, he realized it's going to get dented, it's going to get dinged, it's going to get scratched. But yet, you better understand something, folks. You're human. And because you're human, you have the ability to deal with feelings and emotions. You have the ability to get upset and angry and, 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 and thrilled and joyful like you've never had before. We have, I'm so thankful God gave us emotions. But there's times I think, Lord, why do I feel like this? And you have too. Sometimes we're not honest enough about God. I'm so thankful that David wrote the Psalms and let his heart come out. Yes. Amen. Yes. Man, you want to find out about people who are depressed and upset with things and happy and joyful? Dave, King David was an absolute basket case. Sin, murdered a lady's husband, had, had sex with her, got her pregnant, tried to cover it up by killing the husband, and then when the prophet comes and says, you're the man, oh boy, his life turned around. You do notice, though, that David never committed that sin again. Because he learned. But there's all these emotional things that people deal with. I don't know about you, but it's hard to carry all the things that you have to carry. All the weight, all the stuff, all the pressure, all the things. So, people that are not saved and don't have an understanding of who God is, what can they do with their emotions? They don't have anybody to give it to. They have no one to say, Lord Jesus, help me with this. They have no one to say, Lord, help my unbelief. Because their hearts are depraved. Their minds are gone. And all they think about is what can, what's in it for me in that reality. And these are the ones who stand against the believers in the last days. You want to know why the spirit of Antichrist is so strong? Because he's got a lot of followers right now. He's got more followers than any band. Any, any musician, any celebrity, a Hollywood actor. Because he's going to play right into their feelings. And their emotions. So when it comes to time for the mark of the beast, there's going to be a death and resurrection event. I do not believe, will not believe, that what the current mandates are the mark of the beast. Why? Because Revelation 13 says there's a death and a fake death and resurrection event when he says, Hey, I'm God. And to prove that you think I'm God, get this mark on your right hand and your forehead. And people are just going, yes, we're going to line right up. You do realize that Jesus told us that in the last days, even the elect yes. would be deceived. Yes. So there's ever been a time when we need to realize we need to be in the Word and serving God because these are the people who will be against us and in front of us and trying to force us into those mandates and those situations that are out there. That's the heart that they will have. They will have no common sense, no patience, no tolerance. Isn't it funny? I hate that word. Because that word tolerance has been twisted. 
and tarred and feathered so many times and changed out. Especially when I know that we as Christians are the least tolerated people on the planet. Especially here in America. So let's look at verse 22 as we finish this. And although they know the ordinance of God, man, although they know what God's Word says, even knowing that what they're doing will send them to hell, could kill them, could end their life, could ruin them, they don't care. And so they willingly rebel against what they know in their hearts as truth. That's the world in which you and I live and exist right now. That's the world. At the government level, the federal level, the state level, it doesn't matter what level you're talking about, it's there. Because we're closer to His return, we're closer to, the, to Him coming. They even know that hell awaits Him, and yet they encourage others to join in. Junior year of high school, there was a guy we've been witnessing to in my youth group. And we had, we had a revival in our youth group my sophomore year. We started witnessing to people, praying for people. We had a hit list, not, not, you know, not that, that kind of hit list. People to pray for, because my name had been at the top of the list of people to pray for. We began to pray for people. We began to pray at the church. We began to pray at the altars of the church. You group began to really face what God wanted to do. And so we began to have this revival. We started seeing people in my class saved. And three others and I, we made, we made a pact. That by the time we graduated, every person walking across that graduation stage will have known what the gospel is and how to get saved. That was our, that was our plan. We're not going to graduate until everybody knows. They may not be saved, but they're going to know what they need to do to get saved. And so we would we'd bring our Bibles to class, we'd talk, we'd witness, we'd talk to teachers. Would, any door we all had open, we talked about Jesus. In my sophomore year, the youth group went from about 25 to about 75 in just a couple weeks. And we had people getting saved. I mean, we had people crying. Teenagers my age crying and bawling at the altar. Confessing the sins that you just can't believe. We got to see people healed and, and miracles. We got to see things happen. The school until that time did not let us have a Bible group that would meet and pray on the mornings before school. When I sat down with, 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 with the principal, Mr. Enix, he said, Mr. Enix, there's never been one of these here, we'd like to do it. He said, alright. He said, well, you know, I'm not for sure. I said, well, look, and we began to tell him what's going on. He said, okay, two days a week, fine, with you. Yeah, so we did Tuesdays and Thursdays. We went on one, one day, he gave us two. And so now, in that group, we had to go from a classroom to the gymnasium. Because people started coming in. Because they were seeing the power of God. They were seeing the hand of God at work. A bunch of teenagers who got on fire for Jesus. But yeah, I still heard from people who say, eh, I'd rather go to hell because that heaven is going to be a boring place and nothing fun to do there. But you know what? Even though they walked across that graduation line, they'd heard the gospel, they knew how to... And we taught them what the sinner's prayer was. We told them, you know, if you ever, get, if you ever need, need God to move, here's what you can pray. We made copies of notes to give to everyone in my class so they would know how to do that. We, we, we were serious about it. And God put a passion in us. A passion in us. To the point that even about a year and a half ago, one of the guys that we prayed for for many years contacted me through Messenger and said, Hey, I finally got it. You got saved after 30, after 30 years. So you don't give up. You don't stop praying. You don't stop living your life. You've got to realize there are people out there living that kind of life. And they will support, they will encourage, they will establish, and they will promote evil and plot with it. You want to know why government is what it is today? Because it's lost its way. You want to know why state governments many times and congressmen are so conflicted? Because corruption has come in. And one of the most important things that you can pray, and the guys that pray with me on Tuesday night, know I pray every week that corruption will be revealed in our community. From the council, the mayor's office, to the, ju the, the, the judge executive, and the county council, to every, every judge we have in our community, to law enforcement. Lord, expose those things. Because until it comes out in the light, it's not going to be dealt with. And it may not be real fun to do it when it's out in the light, but nonetheless, we need to pray those things. And you can pray that for your governor, your president, your senators, whoever. Not that there's corruption there, but just pray, Lord, if there is, expose it. Reveal it. Pray that way. Pray that those things are revealed because this is what's happening. We have seen bills passed in Congress that violate this book. And I have been endowed by my Creator with certain inalienable rights. 
Natural rights. So you know what? We've got government documents that recognize that we have a creator. We have a document, government historically, that says we have certain inalienable rights that can never be taken from us or forced upon us or pushed upon us. And yet, this is where we are in the world. So once again, a reminder, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities, forces of darkness in wicked places. And church, if we don't really become fully awake and alert of what we're fighting, we'll never win any battle. We'll never have any victory. We're going to be more upset with the people who said something or did this to us than to realize that the enemy at work in them and through them. And so often we find ourselves, so often we find ourselves rushing to judgment about things. Yet the Word of God is very clear. They also approve of those who practice them. So our battle is spiritual and our battle is supernatural. And that's why we've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit to stand and to live. Kathy, if you come to the keyboard. I usually am pretty very clear about where the altar call is going to go. As I've been preaching, I've had some kind of some, some, some thoughts and ideas go through my mind. Laid in bed awake a lot last night, thinking about yesterday's prayer service and what God was doing and what was coming. But not just about what God was doing, but what was coming. And why there had been such a response to come to Burksville to pray for the church to be so strong. I'm hearing from others who are also sensing that they sense that September. I'm just going to tell you, I've got some real concerns about the week of 9-11 now yeah. because of what's happening in Afghanistan. I'm flying the 6th through the 9th. I'm flying the 5th through the 9th on American. And uh, hearing from some of these places that there's already terror threats. The Pentagon saying that. Military saying that. Homeland Security saying that. You know, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've already contacted some, some agencies in Dallas that if flights aren't coming back, I can rent a car. I've kind of got one on standby, but you never know. Now, is that faithlessness? No, that's me saying Dallas could be a target. It was in 62, so, you know, why not now? So I'm thinking about those things. Does that mean I have fear? No, it means I'm going to think ahead. I'm going to work ahead. Okay, this could happen. If this does, then, then, you know, I've got some things. I've got some things. Anybody else uneasy about the week of 9-11? Let me see your hand. If you're uneasy, you know, and am I saying something's going to happen? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying in my spirit, you know, in the world in which we live, the things that are happening, I'm thinking, Lord, why is this burden there? Yeah. Why is this feeling there? Why am I sensing this need to really be praying about that week? Right. I'm thankful that God wants us. I'm thankful that God advises us. I'm thankful that His Word says, be prepared for these things. And in the world in which we live, I want to remind you, your battle is spiritual. Okay, this is going to begin to play whenever you're ready. If you're here today, and here's where I feel we're going. If you're here today, and you're still trying to come to grips with the world in which we live and some of the crazy things that are happening. And there's fear or there's concern. If you're saying things like, man, I'm really struggling to keep my faith in things. We want to pray for you today. If you're here and you know that God's been telling you, get yourself braced and get yourself ready I talked to some of you from, that were here yesterday, that are here today, and some of you here yesterday that knew they're going back next week, September 1st, they lose their jobs because they're not going to do something. Losing their own source of income. And the righteous will live by faith. We're about to see, we're about to see how the church is going to live by faith when difficulties come. You got congressmen and senators talking, they're threatening, you know, well, if he won't get this, we'll just take their social security. Stuff you work for all your life? Who do these people think they are? We talked about it. Now you know why. They've got the depraved mind. They've been giving them to, to, to all these crazy things. They don't care about you. Which 
means we've got to trust the Lord. And I'm going to say it again and say it again and say it again, church. We're about to see times in America where you're going to really find out who has faith and whose faith is fake. So if you're here and you say, Pastor, man, I, I, just, I know I've got, I've got to be stronger. I've got, I've got to, I, I think we're beyond the preparation. You and I, brother, talked about earlier. I think time for preparation is over in a lot of ways. God's been warning us for several years. Do this, do that, get ready. And I'm hearing more and more people that are saying, you know what, I keep hearing the preference. So when you said that today, it confirms that I've been hearing for, for a while. So what are we going to do when it really gets bad? You're here today and you've got some fears and some concerns. I want you even now as you begin to get up, come on up. This is not a confession. This is you saying, man, i got some real concerns. You might be concerned about your kids, your family, spouses. We want to pray for you. You may be here and you're saying, Pastor Dan, I know i got to get stronger. To face these kind of things, to face these kind of people and folks that are already here. Not just going to knock on your door, they're already here. This, this spirit of Antichrist is already working. So if that's you and you want more of the faith, more of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, even now begin to come. Even now begin to come. And the Lord put it on your heart just to pray and to seek His face. That you need more. That you need more. That you need more. we got to have more of Him, folks. It's going to be Him in us that helps us to stand against the things that are coming, the things that we're going to face. So don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Spirit of the living God. Pray the Lord gives you strength. Pray that the Lord gives you courage. Pray the Lord encourages your faith. Pray the Lord helps you to stand strong in the face of adversity. Pray the Lord gives you the words to say. Jesus said, don't worry about what to say when you stand in front of governors and kings and leaders because the Holy Spirit would give you those words. Many of you at this altar are going to be having that conversation with somebody and the Holy Spirit is going to tell you what to say. He's going to speak to your heart. He's going to speak to your life. You're going to make a difference in that person you're talking to.
close today with a passage from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And this is after he talks about the adversary of the lion, growing like a lion, about to devour you, seeking someone to devour you. Verse 9, Peter says, But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. In other words, hey church, you're not alone. Now I do believe we're about to see some Middle East type activity in this country. Middle East martyrdom. Some of the, the attacks on the church that they've had all over the place. Because America is not exempt from that. The American church is not exempt from that. And then listen to what, what Peter says. This is one of the verses I stand on. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You know the only way that those four things come? After you've suffered. So that message that some people are preaching that America is never going to have an issue or problem, the American Christian is not, never going to suffer, it's not biblical, folks. I just read it to you. It's a lie that's going to hurt a lot of believers. A lot of people are going to start walking away. Well, I never thought this would happen here. Did you read the word? pretty clear. You know what's neat? I believe we're I believe we're braced today. I believe you are braced. Not because of the dream, but because you know what the word says, because in your heart the Spirit of God is telling you it's strong. Get ready. So those of you that are that are visitors today, were here yesterday, thank you for coming to be a part of this. And my prayer is going to be that whatever you got yesterday, you're taking home with you. Whatever you heard and felt today, you're taking home with you. And you become a catalyst for fire. Catalyst for fire. So go home. Let them watch you burn for Jesus. Be instant in season. Preach, teach, live it out. We're very near to the, name, to the, the coming of the Lord. Pray with me, Father God. Lord, we need your, we need your touch. We need your power, we need your authority, we need your fire, we need your help to stand. Lord, there are things coming in the, the, the American church right now that many don't see. Some do, many of us do, Lord, we know it's coming. And so we're braced, but there are some that are not braced, and they will be swept away by the storm that's coming. And just as the hurricane I is hitting New Orleans about this time, Lord, we know there's another hurricane coming of, of attacks and persecution and opposition. Perilous times, Lord, is what Paul called it. But your word says that you've warned us and because you warned us, God, we can know, we can prepare, we can be ready, and we can be braced. So, Lord, when this enemy comes in like a flood, I'm thankful that we are connected to believers around this nation now. who are in this room right now that we can pray for and pray with and trust the Lord to use us everywhere we go. And those who are here this weekend, Lord, from out of state, I pray they take back what they gain, what they learn, and they in turn will see fire start where they are, revival start where they are. And may we become agents of the power of God, laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. Lord, I'm thankful for a brain tumor that's been healed right here, right now. Lord, I believe this will be the, the, the beginning of many, 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 many more healings and miracles. And may the church be ready when everything else shuts down that we are ready to pray for the sick and see miracles and healings. We're ready to tell the world about Jesus and the difference he's made in our lives. So Lord, go with us today and use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for the part.